Uh, good evening to the group. Uh, let me first introduce uh, my partner in this crime, uh, Paul English. Uh, is the program manager of Army Mars. He's a retired uh, soldier like I am, retired as a colonel from the Signal Corps. And uh, in addition to his Army Mars duties, which are substantial, uh, he's responsible for providing the uh, communication support for, uh, for the Army first responders, uh, people who, who respond to emergencies, civil and otherwise, uh, worldwide. So he's, he's got his plate full most of the time, I suspect. Uh, he's, um, his last deployment before retiring in 2012, I believe it was, uh, Paul, and uh, was to the uh, Haiti hurricane disaster down there, which uh, I think they're still trying to sort out. But uh, anyway, we spared no expense to bring Paul up here from Texas. He, <laughs> And, and he's not complaining about it at all. So it is. And this is going to be a two parts. First part is going to be kind of a briefing because when I started to research this and preparation for it, you know, when Larry asked me to talk about Mars, I didn't realize that Mar Mars had moved 30 years away from me. So I went back and did a little research. And it's a good thing because what I found is that the history and of, of uh, Mars and military support by amateurs is pretty much interwoven and they marched on together so we can we can go from there yeah okay I just click so we'll start with uh, this brief overview uh, on the left there you'll see the pigeon and I wanted to introduce remind you of some of the modes that we were restricted to before wireless communication there were wires, of course, horses, runners, snail mail, smoke, flags, lights, and so on. But the problem was that they didn't meet the requirements of time and distance and could not overcome obstacles like you could with wireless. And so we moved on from there through the spark period. And most of us heard our first wireless communications on something called a crystal set. And we built it ourselves. Mine was hooked to the uh, bed springs of my bed. So we're going to start out now with uh, the 1900, you know, beginning this segment of our history. Uh, the Navy was first, of course, because it made sense. They had the greatest need. They had to get across water, hard to string those wires at that time. Uh, the Army came in uh, shortly after that with support to the gold rush up in Alaska. That was kind of a, it needed some civil assistance or civil order. And uh, communication in Alaska is tough if you have to run wires or use one of those other means. Uh, and then down in the Southwest, the Mexican bandits were cutting the wires that the army was using between its units to that kind of uh, slowed up operations at all. So wireless became very important. The period from 1910 to 1915 showed both the government and the amateur community trying to get a hold of this thing. They had a tiger by the tail. The government finally uh, allocated frequencies. That was a first step in putting some order into it, I guess. And of course they gave <laughs> amateurs uh, frequencies that were not usable by other uh, uses as far as at least the government could tell, but Hams overcame that, of course. Uh, the ARRL was established at that time, in that period. And uh, Maxim, uh, a name very familiar to all of you, uh, decided to establish a volunteer radio corps. He did it for uh, PR purposes primarily, and, and it really didn't get much beyond that. But he was trying to make it more visible, make amateurs and their contrib possible contribution uh, vis more visible to the public and in turn to the Congress, which in turn influenced things like allocation of frequencies and other rules pertaining to the use of wireless radio. Long came World War I, 
uh, 4,000 of the 6,000 licensed hams in the country volunteered for military service and provided a core of, of uh, expertise uh, that was helpful, but not enough. The Navy at that time, because they had the most equipment and the most uh, experience with wireless communication, uh, were, were given control of uh, wireless communications by the government. And uh, they liked that so much, as a matter of fact, that uh, after the World War I, <laughs> they had a hard time getting them to leave it go and open up the uh, bands again. But finally, uh, Congress uh, had them do that by, in 1919 and just directed that they were no longer in charge of the whole world of wireless. Uh, learning from World War I, because remember when those first guys, the core of volunteers that went into the military, the Signal Corps knew they were important, but didn't really, hadn't really developed the applications, the uses, all the uses that are, were gonna show up during that war uh, for the amateurs. So they wanted to do something between World War I and World War II, or shortly after that, after World War I, to uh, have some volunteers on call, identified uh, for emergency, civil emergencies, as well as a base for mobilization. And they, they successfully did that um, over for 48 states, actually, using uh, uh, National Guard and Reserve units and so on. Uh, continuing in the in the 20th century, there's KDKA. You see that collection, which is uh, very similar to a basement that was just described to us. Probably it looked kind of looked like mine did when I moved out. Uh, but amateurs, as you know, are, were given to uh, experimentation. Uh, there were very few commercially built radios at that time. And if an amateur wanted to get on the air, he pretty much had to build his own. They went so far as building their own tubes or bulbs as they were called at that time and built the vacuum devices used to create a vacuum that, so that the, the tube could act like a tube we know. Uh, I had to put this little picture in a, on the right there of uh, the Heathkit box uh, that became very familiar to me. That was, I had an SB 101 that served, served me well. Um, 1920 to 1930 showed a rapid growth. I mean, it, it was an explosive growth in uh, commercial radio and in all applications having to do with wireless radio. Uh, but it was a, uh, a dog's breakfast, uh, so to speak. Uh, really disorganized and so on. The War Department tried to get a handle on it a little bit when they joined up with the ARL relay system uh, in their radio net uh, to try to provide uh, a link across the country. The Army Amateur Radio System, then AMARS, was established uh, in this period because uh, the Army realized that they had to get a handle on uh, volunteer uh, support, both before and during uh, emergencies. The FCC came, in, came into business that time and uh, was a great improvement over the Navy uh, running things. Now, uh, wartime showed up again, of course, as uh, everybody, most people expected it would. The mode of choice moved and it evolved from Spark through uh, um, CW, uh, AM, and finally single sideband came in in 1947. I remember witnessing that as I sat listening to our uh, family radio with my ear glued to the, uh, to the speaker. A lot of you probably did the same thing because uh, the airwaves were starting to fill up as uh, people bought commercial radios and it became a prime piece of furniture in most homes. When December 7th came, of course, it closed down all activity again. 
Uh, this time, 25,000 hams were available to go immediately into the military. Uh, some of those who were uh, overweight, <laughs> like some of us get after we retire or, or had some other uh, reason they could not be drafted, uh, were recruited for civil defense. That's that um, air raid warden uh, that some of us became familiar with uh, as we uh, to turn off those lights. From 1950 to 2000, that was we're really getting into an area that many of you remember, um, because the importance of amateur service to military operations and and to morale uh, clearly demonstrated a need uh, that was going to continue. During this period, they reorganized Mars into separate Army and Air Force programs. Navy came along later. Uh, the means of communication uh, for most of these uh, emergencies, if you will, Korea, Vietnam, Gulf War, and so on, uh, were Marsgrams written on a uh, prescribed, uh, like a telegram form, and phone patches. Um, I was privileged to be the director of Army Mars for Georgia and uh, had about 30 or 40 uh, dedicated volunteers who uh, really supported the, the during I had retired then and this was this was during the Gulf War of course my experience came in Vietnam and uh, that is actually that Mars was the reason I'm here right now talking to you at <clears throat> at its peak 47 stations were in Vietnam they averaged about 42,000 messages per month so it, it was something uh, something to behold. I, I didn't want to leave this uh, without telling you a little about that Mars member. And this is by my own experience. <clears throat> These are dedicated guys and gals. Uh, they were patriotic, of course, uh, adaptable to new technology as it came on board. A lot of the surplus equipment became available to uh, Mars members. Had to be a general class amateur, of course, so you're technically skilled in the equipment and the basic communication techniques and able to follow and, and prepared, to, prepared to lead when the situation required. You know, if, if I was not available as the uh, Mars director to, to run the net, uh, someone else had to be prepared to step in. The bottom line on all of this is a discipline uh, which is just a little bit beyond uh, what's expected of the average amateur. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Paul, and he's going to pick up on the second part of this, telling you about Mars is really like today. Okay. All right. Again, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Paul English. I'm a Department of Army civilian. Uh, I work for my headquarters is out of Arizona, although I work here uh, just outside of Fort Hood, Texas. Uh, I am dual-handed. Uh, primary job is uh, to serve as the chief of our Mars. And as Bill said, I also uh, support the uh, uh, for the Army's first responders uh, globally, uh, support fire medical on Army installations. Um, the Mars program... Uh, is designed to provide auxiliary communication to the Department of Defense and to the services. Uh, in the middle of this slide, uh, this really boils down the mission. That contingency communication support. Um, if you look across the newspaper and Google and whatnot, and you'll see splashed all over the page, all over the place, the, the military community is realizing that uh, satellite communications isn't all that it's cracked up to be, especially in a worst day type of scenario, uh, because every day uh, the ability to take out satellite communications increases. And for the longest time, that's where the military was really uh, hanging their hat, satellite communications. And they've started to realize in the last really five years that, hey, we need to look for some other means to uh, beyond line of sight, BLOS, uh, which is what the, uh, the satellites really do. And they suddenly realized something called 
high frequency communications that we probably need to look more into. And right now, the, the real expertise for how do you do HF communication really resides in us. Um, I've been to a couple of the service schools where they teach HF, and they're very good about teaching the knobology and switchology of the radio, but they don't teach the art of HF. And as you all know, um, the art of that is really the hard piece to get your arms around. Yeah, you can, uh, you can hang an antenna, but why are you hanging an antenna in a way that you are? How, how will you be able to communicate? And that's where the Mars member really shines, is in the art of, of HF. A couple other bullets. Uh, we have dabbled in providing international humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. Uh, if you remember back in 2015, the, uh, the massive earthquake that struck uh, the city of Kathmandu, Nepal, uh, we had been working with amateur radio operators in the country uh, for two years for that exact scenario. We started that in 2013. 2015, we got to put that into use. Uh, the last big mission is to provide defense support to civil authorities. Uh, we are a military auxiliary, and if we wanted to support to a state or county EOC, we have to follow specific guidance because that is categorized as defense support authorities. Uh, for too long, we were stepping on the Aries and Races um, um, footprint. You know, that's really the Aries and Races where they shine. Uh, again, we are a military auxiliary. Um, our members are all amateur radio operators. Uh, we used to request, uh, we don't anymore come to us with an amateur radio ticket and we will work to train you up uh, to make sure that you can provide the community support uh, that the military needs. On this diagram, uh, th this uh, uh, network bubble diagram, what I'm trying to show here, and let me turn on my laser pointer. Nope, that's not it. There we go. What I'm trying to show here in the middle, not that the Mars programs are the center of the universe, slideology wise, this was the easiest way to portray the legs that we reach into. So an average Mars member on any given day could be working with US Northern Command, which we do on a regular basis, to support defense of the homeland. Uh, there have been a number of times where NORTHCOM has requested our support to rise of exercises with various uh, state and, and local officials in exercises called vital connections, where they would bring uh, the guard, the air guard, uh, FEMA would show up, we would have the state EOC, we'd have county EOCs, we'd have first responders. And we talked, we, we worked communications interoperability. Um, our primary mission is this Chairman's Order 2, two, two tag team, uh, where that is actually a classified mission where we support the National Command Authority, where we serve as the primary chef network interface in the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, they run a federal HF network similar to the Mars program reach out to other federal agencies and other critical infrastructure key resource partners. We interoperate with the Air Force's Civil Air Patrol. Uh, we have uh, Mars counterparts in Canada. They're called the Canadian Force uh, Auxiliary Radio System. Uh, we support and pick up phone patch communications to the Air Force's High Frequency Global Communication System. So you heard Bill talk about phone patches. We still have 30 operators, both Army and Air Force, on a daily basis that are running HF phone patch. Uh, these are primarily for uh, aircraft, uh, force aircraft, and they will handle everything from a morale call uh, to uh, gathering uh, the latest weather information for where they're going, also handle in-flight emergencies. If an air crew was unable to talk to their normal control authorities, They'll come up on uh, Air Force Mars for the phone patch. We'll patch them into the tower or their ground station and uh, you know, work to relay emergency 
again, uh, one that I monitored one time, uh, there was an Air Force aircraft inbound from Europe that uh, the cabin depressurized at altitude. And it's a, a serious thing. You know, some of the folks' uh, eardrums were burst, you know, bleeding from the ears. They couldn't raise anybody else. But they could talk to the Air Force Mars. I got them in contact with emergency controllers, got them rerouted to the closest uh, field that could handle them, and they landed safely. Uh, we do training with the National Guard and Reserves, and then we also interface with the amateur radio community. So that gives you just a sample, uh, you know, on a regular basis, what the average Mars member can be up to uh, just because uh, of their affiliation with the Mars program. So in this slide, what I'm trying to show is the different flavors of how amateur radio operators can see communication support. Uh, you've all probably heard of the ARIES, Amateur Radio Emergency Service. Uh, this is all categorizing categorization of these different services. So this is primarily a local response. You're primarily using VHF, UHF, you'll use networks. Uh, you'll have some HF in there. The Radio Amateur Civil Emergency Service. This is getting local and now up to regional response. You'll have HF communications play a larger role, but you're still using VHF and HF. And then the Mars system. Mars is really at the national level, liaising down into the, the, the region and state level. Ours is HF, and we do do some limited HF. So during a typical exercise, like we have one coming up in October, we request for information where we will be asked to reach out into the amateur radio community to collect essentially county status report. Is your lights on? Do you have power? What's the water situation? What's the uh, transportation situation? What's the hospital situation? We'll have that conversation. And then we'll compile that information and send that back up to the to the DOD headquarters. So, so that's really how the amateur radio operator can in an emergency capacity at the local, at the state, county, or national level. A um, sample of the types of activities that our members are into during a year. Um, because of COVID-19 this year, a lot of uh, exercises uh, that have been uh, turned off uh, just because of COVID response. But a couple that I'd like to highlight, DRD, DOD QRPX, uh, QRP, low power. Uh, for the last five years, we've done a low power HF competition where we bring in military units, active duty, National Guard Reserve, Canadians, and we have them compete with but we base everybody, we baseline everybody. The, the uh, tactical green radio that the military uses has a power out of watts. And so in order to compete, we limit everybody to no more than 25 watts output power, and you have to put a or field expedient antenna, and then you go out and you make contacts. This is our field day, essentially, at the end to the college core everyone's points and then we have two categories we have uh, the DOD category and then we have the Mars category. Uh, up in October uh, we are doing our DOD COMEX 20-4. For this exercise we are going to be interfacing with the ARRL simulated tests and we're also going to be sending a number of ICS 213 message forms into the ARRL national traffic system, as well as the Radio Relay International traffic system. Uh, first time we've done that, so I'm, I'm really excited to see how how it felt. Um, every year for the last five years, the Canadian Signal Corps has run an international HF competition. So uh, uh, I believe it was a, a Norway station that won. Uh, last year, there was a station from uh, South America that won. It's the Canadians that uh, that run the boards in uh, in their international competition and win out. Uh, there have been 
eight operators from nine different nations that compete in that international competition. Uh, so we look forward to that every year, and that's coming up again in October. So I talked about that county status report. Uh, this is a Google Earth snapshot we did in our July exercise from the 20th to the 24th, we had our Mars operators reach out to the amateur radio community on nets, on HF, on 60 meters. And everywhere that you see a green splotch for a county, that means that we received at least one status report from amateur radio operators in that county. Uh, we had a total of 432 counties uh, status reports during that four day. Um, when you think about it, you know, there's 3,143 counties and county equivalent, uh, and you say, well, you only got 432. But think about it, in a infrastructure denied environment, if traditional forms of communication are no longer available, would you rather have 432 status reports from all across the country or none? That's what we're really talking about. So when you put it in those figures, I would much rather have 432. Yes, I'd like to have 3,100, but 432, you can see across the U.S., gives you a good snapshot of what conditions are throughout the U.S., which the, the supported headquarters at DOD can then use to, to gauge where a national response effort might have to take place. And think about this in the worst day types of scenarios where you have massive spread communication outages, power outages, something that's affecting large swaths of the country. You know, phones are down, internet's down, uh, radio stations are off the air, you know, that sort of thing. We train for and why we reach out to the amateur radio community to provide snapshots of, of this, the current situation. Um, I'm sure you've all heard of WWV and WWVH. Uh, we have partnered with the National Institute of Standards and Technology, who is the parent organization for WWV and WWVH. We have secured uh, test time slots every hour. On WWV, it's 10 minutes after the hour, and on WWVH, it's 50 minutes past the hour. It's a 40 second time, so, you know, there's no, not a lot of information that you can pack in there, uh, but we plan to run those broadcasts starting probably the third week of September, running through October. So I'd encourage you to tune your HF radio over to WWVH, take a listen to the broadcast, and that broadcast will also ask you to take a listener survey at this URL. And that listener survey will ask you a lot of questions about when did, what station did you hear, what frequency did you hear it on, what time, and then how do those stations. And the partnership that I've worked with NISD is we share those survey results with WWV, WWVH, so that their headquarters knows how they're opening and how their stations are being used. So think of about a few years ago, two and a half years, where there was all that uh, media about WWV being shut down. That's really what we're trying to help with here by gathering information from the everyday user. How do you use those stations so that WWV can provide that to their NIS to help them justify why they're on the air? I talked about interop with the amateur radio community. 60 meters is where I'm really trying the interop. And you're asking yourself, why 60 meters? These five channels are the only five frequencies across the dial where the feds, the Department of Defense, you know, all of these other select federal agencies and the amateur radio community are authorized to talk to one another on the same channel. And I get a lot of questions about, well, I'm not sure I, as an amateur radio station, am authorized to talk to the feds. 
97.111, and you squint your eyes just enough, under this regulation, you are authorized to talk to the feds, and the feds are authorized to talk to you. And we've had this confirmed by the FCC. They said, yep, 97.11, you have all of the authorities that you need to talk fed to amateur and amateur to fed. The other key point to remember is they're spectrum police. And so if you hear a federal station up on 60 meters and they ask for a stem back to them, that's great. That's what they want. They're looking to interoperate with you. And you know, nobody's going to call the, the spectrum police on those channels. No, we encourage that. The key to remember is that the feds have primary frequency authorization on those channels, amateur radio services, secondary authorization. So if a fed station is asking to use a channel and you're on their you know, right tune with, with your neighbor like you do every day at noon, please show some courtesy and yield the channel to the fed if you can provide assistance because it may be a NORTHCOM exercise where we want to interoperate with you. I encourage the use of interoperability with feds. If you hear them up on the air, you know, please come join us. Um, I mentioned the QRPX. Uh, we had a total of 144 stations. This is just a smattering of all of the military stations that were on the air during that exercise. And you can see where the Marines at Camp Pendleton actually won, and they beat out one of our uh, Air Force Mars members by five points. So that's pretty good. But the key is all of these military students are on the air looking to talk, looking to increase their, their HF skills, their HF capability. Here taken from that exercise. In the upper left, these are some soldiers at Joint Base Lewis McCord, Fort Lewis, Washington. Their PC 150, 20 watt HF radio. They've got their, their whip antenna in the background. You can see a couple of dipole antennas that they put up, 12s. Here's one of our Mars guys sitting out on his back patio. He's running on emergency, on his emergency barrel sitting out there comfortable and making contacts and scoring points. Here's the Royal Canadian Signal out on a, on a nice lake, although this is in March in Canada, so I'm not sure how actually nice the weather was. But again, you can see they're running some sort of dipole and they're out there making points. Here's some uh, Marines out at Camp Pendleton, California. And here you can see each of these black things is a big old zip tie. And then you can see we've got some wire, some wire, QF-16, that's coming off of those center insulators. Anybody take a guess as to what type of field expedient these Marines are making? Anybody want to jump in? Is it a beverage of some sort? Uh, close, not a beverage. It's actually a field expedient log pure type array. See all these elements coming off? That was in a Marine Corps signal manual of high expedient log, log periodic antenna. Wow. And that's what they were doing. <laughs> we had a National Guard special forces, or maybe it was a reserve special forces unit in uh, Minnesota. They won one year. They were using, they had V-beam antenna oriented west, they had one oriented south, and they had one oriented west. And as the propagation changed, you know, as the hours of the day changed, they'd start out on one antenna, they'd move to the next antenna, to the last antenna, you know, just to maximize propagation. And they, they scored the most points that year. 
So that's it in a nutshell. Uh, that's what we are up to these days. Um, the Mars member brings their own gear. Uh, the equipment program has ended. Uh, we really don't have anything uh, that we can offer, you know, with the green radios, the type one. So the Mars member brings their expertise, brings their time, brings their equipment. Uh, some of the modes that we use, uh, we have gone to an all standard mode. It's called MILF standard 188 110. It's a serial phase shift key mode. And it is in with the TAC chat mode in the Harris radio. And that's why we've gone to that digital mode as opposed to an amateur mode like MT6. By using that uh, mic 110, uh, we can talk with uh, digitally the uh, the Harris radio, and there's like 10,000 Harris radios across the, the Department of Defense, and those are being upgraded now to the uh, PRC 160, which is a a big HF antenna. So once again, thank you for your time. Uh, I hope you found this uh, presentation interesting. Um, I will say that on the presentation, there's about 40 more slides of different types of uh, briefing charts that I use depending on the forum that I'm in. Uh, there's an information, there's a nice handy reference uh, solar index uh, graph chart that if you want, you can stick that in your hip pocket. It's a, uh, a red, amber, green for solar flux, A, a index, K index, et cetera, that you're, you're free to use. And I just mentioned about the MARS program if you're interested. Uh, and uh, Bill has those slides, so, you know, if you want to take a look at those, you know, uh, please uh, uh, get Bill, email me, and I'll send those out to you. So, once again, uh, thanks, everybody. I, I appreciate your time, and I'll stand by to see if uh, if. This was excellent.